Thank you, everybody, for joining us today. We're really excited to talk about our work that we've done under the NASA HateCast um, project with their support. Um, I'm Jason West, and I have, uh, I'm here at the University of North Carolina. I have within my office several people that I've worked with as part of our team. Um, so we have over here is Mark Sayre. Mark is a, a professor in my department as well. He's a space-time statistician, and he's developed these Bayesian maximum entropy methods over the course of his career. He'll be leaving early today to um, teach class, um, and so I'll be presenting those methods. Um, Jacob Becker, Marissa DeLang, and Stephanie Cleland are all master's students in our department that have been supported by HACAS to do this work. Um, so I'll start talking and then I'll, uh, I'll set up the, the general framework of the problems that we're trying to use. Um, we'd like you to take away from this uh, session not only what did we accomplish with HACAS support over the past few years, but an understanding of um, uh, data fusion methods and how they can be useful and, per and perhaps an improvement over what's often used. Um, for representing concentrations, especially when we're thinking about uh, concentrations that are important for public health. Okay, so let's get into it. Um, so to motivate what we're doing, I'll start with the Global Burden of Disease Assessment. I imagine some of you have familiarity with this, but um, the last Global Burden of Disease Assessment uh, estimated that ambient PM2.5 pollution is responsible for about three or so million deaths per year ambient ozone pollution, about half a million deaths per year. On the left at the um, bottom are the um, uh, several different risk factors that GBD studied, finding that number 10 there is the uh, ambient particulate matter, the most important environmental risk factor for health. Um, uh, and if we add up ambient PM 2.5 and ozone, that's one of every 19 deaths globally. We'll explain later that this estimate of about half a million deaths um, was based on the maps that we produced of ozone concentrations, and we'll describe how we did that through data fusion. Um, but before we go on, uh, just to put this into perspective as well, there's been new research that has uh, revised the functions that are used for uh, um, PM 2.5 related mortality. And when you use those new revised functions, they estimate much greater, they say nearly uh, 9 million or so deaths per year from particulate matter. So we really think that this is an important risk factor and uh, the most important environmental risk factor for health. Uh, I like to show this slide just for public education. If we focus on the United States, the GBD estimates about 110,000 deaths per year. That's one of every 25 deaths in the United States. Uh, we've done some work as well that comes up with lower numbers, about 50,000 or so. Uh, but then uh, what this shows is how that compares with other prominent causes of death in the United States. So um, air pollution is more important for health than is all transportation accidents and all gun shootings, um, or more important than uh, breast cancer plus prostate cancer. Okay, so the general problem that we have Air pollution is important for health, so we need to understand at fine spatial resolution what people are being exposed to. And of course, those exposure maps change hour to hour and day to day. Uh, and we have different sources of information. So when we use monitoring stations on the left, we have um, uh, point measurements of PM2.5 at particular locations. Um, and those we expect are high quality, and so we usually assume that they're correct. Um, and uh, they're easy to download those measurements and work with them, but um, they don't necessarily provide information about um, air pollution over a very large area. We also have models, uh, and those computer models, of course, are getting better. Uh, by the way, I'm stealing this slide, these figures from Stephanie Cleland, who will talk later about the work to map in California. Um, and so using a model, you get knowledge of atmospheric chemistry and physics, and you get uh, understanding driven by an understanding of mission. So we have complete space-time coverage, but that uh, model is likely to be biased and incorrect in some uh, cases. Satellites are great. They give us full space-time coverage as well. Uh, using some satellites, we can get uh, daily overpasses. 
Um, but they have limitations as, as well. Um, they're, uh, they have uncertainties in, uh, in the retrieval, in the conversion from uh, aerosol optical depth to uh, ground level PM 2.5. So those are the limitations that we have. And when we think about how these are often used, if we want to represent exposure, we might do some sort of spatial smoothing like Krigging on the monitoring station data. We might just use the modeling data um, with no bias correction. We might try to bias correct it. We might just use the satellite product. But in fact, what we found is that by using many different sources of information and putting them together in a data fusion met uh, using data fusion methods, we're likely to be doing better than if we used each of these sources of information individually. And so that's what we'll focus on today. The methods that we use um, really developed quite a lot by Mark Sayre and applied to a wide range of environmental problems, not just air pollution. Um, these are called Bayesian maximum entropy, and uh, they're um, illustrated in the figure here. So we have um, uh, site-specific knowledge that are, is knowledge of concentrations at a specific space-time location. Uh, and then we have general knowledge as well that might be um, given to us by uh, models. These are the mean trends, um, the covariance, and the variance. So the Bayesian maximum entropy method will take point measurements given here by the points, can uh, look at those observations to get what's called a mean trend here. We'll call that later a global offset. We might have a model or a satellite uh, that has, uh, is offset from those. Uh, it's not a perfect predictor of the, of the mean trend or the observations. Um, and there's some uncertainty around the model or the satellite. The Bayesian maximum entropy methods would um, treat the observed values, we treat them here as hard data, which means that they're assumed to be completely correct. We can also, within these methods, treat them as soft data, which means that they have um, uncertainty around them. And here the model has uncertainty around it. So um, the methods that we use then will use these point estimates and force the estimation to go exactly through those point estimates. The uh, influence of that point estimate will fall off with distance away from the point estimate. Um, and that distance is given by the spatial covariance that we get from the observations. Um, and um, where we are very far from observations then, such as over here, we're going to tend toward the uh, model where it has low uncertainty and tend toward the uh, mean trend where the model has high uncertainty. And so the uh, BME methods are uh, meant to be a, a way of dealing with this in a way that gives us a spatially smooth outcome, but that reflects the information given to it from uh, different sources of information. One of the other methods that we use that I'll describe here um, is known as the constant an analysis of model performance or the camp correction. Um, here we've shown some observations for the, uh, um, uh, where we have the model on the x-axis observations. This is for global ozone, so stealing one of Marissa's figures. Um, and here we find that the model tends to overpredict the highest values of ozone. Uh, and we found that in many cases this is true, that the models tend to overpredict the very highest values. What we've done here is then bin the values into 10 bins, um, where there's the same number of observations within each bin, uh, and then use this line that we uh, derived here to then correct for the model bias. And we do this in a way that we're correcting differentially over the, over the range of model values. So uh, what we would do then is if our model is predicting a value of 55, we would then read up here and then go across to the observed value of about 50. So then we would correct the bias down for a point here that would be about a correction of five parts per billion. Okay. We're going to talk through two different applications of these BME data fusion methods. The first is our efforts to um, map global ozone concentrations, which we did to support the global burden of disease assessment. And Marissa will talk about that. 
And then um, we'll turn to Stephanie, who will talk about the uh, mapping of PM 2.5 from the October 2017 California wildfires. I'll just introduce the work that we've done for the um, mapping of global ozone concentrations. Our goal here is to estimate global surface ozone by statistically fusing together global ozone observations and an ensemble of global models. Um, our stakeholder here is the Global Burden of Disease Assessment, and we've had a large team of people working on this. So a uh, number of people here at UNC, we worked quite closely with Owen Cooper and Kailan Chang at University of Colorado and NOAA, and then other people that put together what's known as the Tropospheric Ozone Assessment Report. This is the largest uh, compilation of ozone observations that's ever been put together. And then we're linking that here with uh, information on ozone concentration that comes from a number of different global models. Many of these were part of the Chemistry Climate Model Initiative. So our first work on this supported the Global Burden of Disease 2017 assessment. It was Kailan Chang and, and Owen Cooper working in collaboration with us, but really Kailan uh, did the number crunching here. Um, and this work was published last year in Geoscientific Model Development. Well, uh, I should say as well, the metric that we were aiming for here was we were looking at an average of 2008 to 2014 um, and used a ozone metric, which is the six month average of the eight hour daily maximum surface ozone concentration, because that's what was useful for the um, global burden of disease assessment, what was requested by them. So we did this um, uh, mapping here of uh, uh, by doing data fusion using the TOR observations. This shows the observation locations and the values of ozone at those different locations. Um, we had then a number of different global models. Again, the global models give us sp uh, uh, good spatial coverage, whereas the observations, obviously there's huge regions of the world like Africa and Latin America where we have very few observations. Uh, the model helps to fill in those uh, places. What Kailan did in this work was basically to use a number of different global models. We bias corrected those models and selected for each world region, so North America, South America, Europe, et cetera. We, uh, Kailan came up with an algorithm to select the, um, the different models and put weights on them based on their ability to reproduce the observations within each region. So we're using then a different combination of models in each world region and then smoothing the surfaces so we don't have discontinuities at the boundaries of different regions. And the net output that we generated here is shown here and was delivered to Global Burden of Disease for their use in the 2017 assessment. Okay, and I'll turn it over now to Marissa who will describe the work that we did um, since this 2017 product um, to focus on um, uh, to focus on uh, producing ozone uh, maps to support the forthcoming global burden of disease 2019 assessment. Okay, Marissa. Thanks, Jason. Okay, so we identified five different ways we could improve upon the previously used M3 fusion method. The first improvement was to reduce the yearly output from 1990 to 2017. So this is the whole GBD study period in comparison to the previous method, which only used a um, average over a range of years. Um, second, we added in um, additional observations and models. So this includes China data that became available in 2013 and was not used in the previous method. Um, in the M3 fusion method, there's a bias correction that happens over a subjective two degree, two degree radius. Um, and so you want to use BME data fusion to instead um, allow for the smooth weighting of observations across both space and time. And this time influence is very important for um, monitoring stations that are not consistently measured over the entire time period. So um, locations that only have measurements in a few years can still, those measurements can be used over multiple years. Um, and then finally, we added a spatial pattern of a, from a fine resolution model output to inform the fine resolution output of our, our, of our methods. So we used two main data sources for our observational data. This is the tropospheric ozone assessment report that Jason already mentioned. So this has high spatial coverage in North America, Europe, South Korea, and Japan. And shown in the figure on the right, um, these are all the locations that have a measurement 
over or have values for one year. So these were not all measured every year, but um, each of these points was measured at least one year during the whole 1990 to 2017 period. And also we included um, data from the Chinese National Environmental Monitoring Network. So this came online in 2013 and was run from 2013 to 2017. Um, from these data sources, we processed hourly output to the um, metric that Jason had mentioned, so the ozone season daily maximum eight-hour mixing ratio. Um, these are shown in the maps on the right over different years. So in 1995, there are a few observations um, in North America and Europe, and then there's more observations 10 years later in 2005, and then by 2015, that China data is added, and now there's high spatial coverage in North America, Europe, and China. We also um, incorporate atmospheric model output. So we use nine models, um, most from CCMI. There are seven models over the 1990 to 2010 time period with fewer models available in the later years. Um, we process hourly output from each of these to the same ozone metric, the OSGMA8, and then combine them using the M3 fusion method. Um, so this is the same method that was used previously to make this multi-model composite where um, there's a linear combination of models using weights that minimize the mean square error by region and year. So this is showing for 2005, each of the eight regions and the model weights um, with each of the models. And then the, the multi-model composite is shown on the right as this OSDMAH metric. So we use the Bayesian maximum entropy framework um, to incorporate all of this. So first we have our hard data or observations, um, which is from TOR or CNEMC. We also include um, we also include the multi-model composite and it has this as our global offset. We subtract this global offset from the observations to get hard data residuals. Um, and these residuals are what we model using BME. From the residuals, we get the covariance. Um, so this is the um, influence, a range of influence of a measurement over space and time. Um, so the spatial covariance drops off pretty quickly. So after about one degree, the influence of a me measurement um, drops off pretty significantly, but the temporal covariance lasts a lot longer. So um, the influence of a measurement um, is longer over time, which is important in this um, space time. Um, fusion that we're performing. So once we have the covariance, the residuals, an estimation grid, and then we also have BME parameters that we um, decide upon, we get our modeled ozone, which is the offset removed ozone. We combine this back with that multi-model composite that we use as an offset and get our BME mean and variance. Um, this BME mean and variance um, has a few features. So um, so the BME mean matches observations at monitoring stations, but then this observation drops off um, based on that space-time covariance and away from any observations, the output's equal to the multi-model composite. Um, so this is shown in the figures um, that are cycling through on the right. So this is showing all years 1990 to 2017. Um, another feature of BME is that a variance is outputted along with the BME mean. So each of these um, locations also has a variance where it is low near observations because that is our hard data and we're assuming that that is true. And then away from observations, the variance increases um, to a maximum of that's related to the covariance. Um, so this is just showing one example of the year. So this is 2005. The top two figures are our data, so the observations and our multi-model composite. The bottom left shows our BME estimation, so the combination using observations and the models. And then to really see how the observations are changing the multi-model composite, we subtract the composite from the BME estimation shown in the bottom right. Areas that are shown in red are areas where we our output is higher than multi the multi-model composite, meaning that there is an observation that was higher than the multi-model composite in that area. And then areas in blue are where our estimation is lower than the multi-model composite. Um, this is just showing for another year. So this is 2015 when China data is available. And you can see in that difference plot in the bottom right that there's a lot of correction taking place um, based on all that China data that um, the models were not able to predict that variability. But then when we added in the observations, we could better capture that. 
Um, so one thing we want to look at was how the, the observations were able to influence across time. So in 2012, this is right before China data became available for 2013 to 2017, we ran BME using two different methods, one called the space-time method. So this is what we've been showing where observations influence across both space and time, and then one called the space-only method where observations can only influence across space. And by running BME two ways and then subtracting um, the outputs, we can see that the space-time method provides a lot of correction over China, even though there weren't many data points in China in this year. So this is showing that the later um, China data from 20, 2013 to 2017 was able to correct in 2012. Um, after we did our BME output, which we ran at 0 0.5 degree resolution, we add fine resolution by um, using the NASA G5NR10 model. This model was run at 0 0.125 degree resolution from July 2013 to June 2014. So we regridded this model to 0 0.1 degree resolution and then used the spatial pattern to um, inform the spatial pattern of our output. So the, um, the left map shows our BME course resolution, so just the same value over the whole 0 0.5 degree grid cell. The middle map is showing um, the NASA model output, and then on the right is our BME output, which now has fine resolution, which matches the pattern of the model. Um, to look at the, how our um, method performed, we performed a leave one out cross validation. Um, we first did a multi-model mean, which is just the average of all the models available in the given year. Um, the multi-model composite performed better than this, as we expected, because it was weighted based on its performance against observations. We then um, looked at the space only correction, so observations can only correct in the year that they were measured, and this performed better than the multi-model composite. And the space time correction further improved upon this. When we added in the fine resolution step, um, the performance decreased a little, but this was necessary for our um, output to be at fine resolution, which was needed for the bulk of burden of disease assessment. Um, so the key features of our output, we made yearly ozone distribution maps for 1990 to 2017, which incorporated observations and model output. The observations were able to influence across both space and time, and then we added fine resolution according to a fine resolution model. And this output was provided to both burden of disease for the 2019 assessment. And then I'll pass it off to Jacob to talk about how we're improving upon this work. Yeah, so as Marissa mentioned, uh, essentially what we're doing is we're taking that multi-model mean um, composite that uh, Kylon created and we're correcting around it based on the covariance, uh, based on those observations. Uh, but the thing we want to do is correct the model outside of where we had observations because where we have the covariance only allows us to correct within about a degree or two. Uh, but we saw that there were some general trends from CAMP where the model tended to overpredict high values and underpredict low. So we didn't want to necessarily correct the entire model based on the entire world's worth of data. So we're doing essentially a regionalized version of CAMP or RAMP. Uh, and what we do is we, for every single data point that we want to, or sorry, for every single estimation point we want to correct, we look at that estimation point and we select all the observations that are the closest to it. Well, we are looking at around 250 observations uh, each year and then looking at the years before and after it. So we're taking each of those uh, observation points that are close to it, we're matching it with the model value there. And just like Jason talked about with CAMP, we're essentially creating these bins, sorting them into it, and finding what the actual trend is uh, and what sort of patterns we see in the model. So as you can see for this, we saw again that overprediction at the high end, uh, and that dark black line is what will now correct what originally the thin black line was too. The other thing that we did that was different with CAMP is we didn't want to have a high model value necessarily lead to a lower final value because sometimes you might see a negative slope where the model for whatever reason that area showed that as it went high the observations went down so we restrict the slope to be greater than zero to make sure that we you know respect the model uh, and treat higher values of the model at least as high as lower values of the model good um we'll turn it to stephanie now and we'll hear about the work using these methods to apply to the um uh, to uh, smoke concentrations, PM concentrations from the October 2017 wildfires in California. 
Thank you, Jason. So this is another example of how we can use the Bayesian maximum entry method along with CAMP to get good estimates over space and time. And this is focusing, so on the next slide, we're focusing specifically on the 2017 Northern California fires, but the idea behind this is this could be applied to any fire event. But the, we're focusing on the 2017 ones because at that point they were the highest concentrations ever recorded in the Bay Area. About 7.2 million people were exposed to unhealthy air in the Bay Area, and there was a lot of destruction and health impacts. And being able to understand uh, wildfire smoke concentrations during a fire event is important, given first that they're going to be happening with increased frequency, intensity, and severity due to climate change, and given that smoke exposure increases the respiratory and cardiovascular mor morbidity and mortality. So if we look at what's commonly used, kind of as what Jason talked to about earlier, is the three data sources that are often used to characterize population level exposure to wildfire emissions. It includes observations, chemical transport models, and satellite-based measurements. And as he mentioned, they have pros and cons. But when using these, the ways that people often use these to estimate smoke concentrations are through a spatial interpolation of observations um, on the next slide, um, through chemical transports by themselves, and sometimes these are adjusted by monitoring data or satellite remote sensing data. And then there's also approaches where people have done geostatistical methods to combine modeled with satellite derived, um, modeled of satellite derived and observations. And this is through data fusion, regression modeling, or machine learning methods. And the big takeaway is what we see is combining multiple PM 2.5 data sets often leads to improvements in the estimations during a wildfire. So building off that, our goal going into this was to produce accurate uh, daily estimates of daily average ground level PM 2.5 concentrations during the October 2017 fires. And the way we're doing this is we're first bias correcting a CMAP model and AOD estimated PM 2.5 concentrations. We're then using those corrected outputs as data in the Bayesian maximum entropy framework to fuse them with observations. And then in order to determine which BME method and which combination of these PM 2.5 data sources best estimate the ground level concentrations, we're evaluating the accuracy of four different approaches to do this. And we want to emphasize that no prior study has evaluated the accuracy of combining all of these three data sets to estimate wildfire-related PM 2.5 while also correcting for the bias present in satellite and CTM data. So um, the data we used were surface observations, and this include, uh, included observations from Permanent monitoring FRM FEM stations, um, there's 114 of those across California, and also data from 49 temporary monitoring stations. And these are things that the U.S. Forest Service put out during an event like a fire to monitor um, air quality in unmonitored locations. We're also using CMAP model output in California at a four kilometer resolution, which was provided by the Bay Area Air Quality Management District. And we're getting satellite derived estimates from the MODIS Terra satellite uh, AOD data. And this is just a quick picture of what each of these look like. So kind of re-referencing the BME framework, the way this data fusion works, as Jason explained, is our observations are hard data. So at that location, we always estimate the observed value. And then we treat the corrected CMAP model and satellite data as soft. And the way we get a variance around these is through that camp correction that I'm going to go over in a second. Um, so that's how we fuse those together. Um, so in order to prepare those satellite and model data for um, incorporation into the BME framework, we have to do a few steps. So the first step um, is first converting that AOD to PM 2.5 because uh, satellites don't directly measure PM 2.5, so we have to make that conversion. And for our purposes, we're doing that using a simple linear regression. And then once we have those uh, satellite based estimates, we're correcting both the CMAP model and the AOD estimated PM 2.5. So to convert AOD to PM 2.5, we match AOD um, observations to observed uh, PM 2.5, fit a simple linear regression to that, and then use that resulting equation um, to convert all of the AOD values to AOD-derived PM 2.5. And the image on the bottom kind of shows what that conversion looks like. So once we have those values, what we do next is we do the camp correction. And what the camp correction does is it basically accounts for the nonlinear relationship between estimated and observed PM 2.5 data. So on the left, I have the CMAP model correction, and I also have the satellite. And you can see it's correcting slightly differently because those data sources are biased in different ways, and CAMP is able to do that. And the red line on the bottom is the variance associated with that correction, and that's the variance we use 
in the BME data fusion as how accurate that estimate is at any space time location. So once, and this is also what that looks like. So on the left of that picture, you see a much higher values in the CMAC model. Once you correct it based on observed, you see a reduction in those extremely high values. And with that, you actually see an increase in some of those lower values once you can't correct it. And that's based on what we observe from the monitoring stations. And it also results in a reduction. It basically increases the accuracy. So you see a reduced mean square error and it increased R squared once you can't correct. So using these outputs, we compared four different ma uh, mapping methods, which was space time BME critting on PM 2.5 observations. So we're not using any satellite or um, model data in this. We're just doing an interpolation of observations. And then we also are comparing that to three different data fusions one of the model and the observations, one of the satellite and the observations, and one of all three. So looking at results, one of the first things we wanted to look at was the added value of temporary stations. So we wanted to see how that, if that improved the estimate to include those temporary stations. And it, as you can see in the picture, you get a lot more coverage. The orange shots are the temporary stations. So you get a lot higher coverage in areas that are unmonitored, and this results in more accurate estimates. So you can see a drop in the mean square error and an increase in the R squared once you include that. And that's partially due to increasing the number of stations you're using and also increasing the number of space time observations we're using. And also another benefit is in some of the most impacted regions, which is Northern California, you see a nice refinement in that smoke plume shape by including the temporary stations. So when we look at the comparison of the four BME methods versus the uh, model and the satellite, is the first thing we wanted to know, as I mentioned, that CAMP does improve the accuracy of a CMAC and satellite-derived products. Next, we want to call out that um, all of the BME space and cooking and data fusion methods did perform better than either the standalone CMAC or satellite-derived products. So doing any BME approach outperforms the standalone model or uh, satellite data, corrected or not. And then once we're looking at within those four methods, using a leave one out cross-validation result evaluates the accuracy at monitoring station locations. And when we do this, what we see is that the space time picking and observation, so not using the satellite data or the model data, um, uh, estimates best at those monitoring station locations. But digging into this a bit more, we wanted to kind of see what it looks like once you're further from monitoring stations. Because estimating at monitoring stations is valuable, but those are often located in highly uh, densely populated regions, and lots of the impacts you see with wildfire smoke don't occur in those regions. So this uh, graph shows how accurate those different methods are as you get further from the closest monitoring station. So you can see once you're more than half a degree away from the closest monitoring station, which is about 35 miles, you see that um, fusing CMAC with observations improves the estimate once you're further than that distance. Um, additionally, if you look at adding the CMAC model, you can also see refinements in the slope boom shape. So on the next slide, um, this is the four methods, what they look like. This is on October 10th as an example. And I have the four methods up there. And you can see with the BME Korean observations, you get this very smooth surface, which isn't necessarily reflective of what smoke plumes look like, given that they have very steep spatial gradients. So by including the satellite data and or including the CMAC uh, model, you do see a big refinement in what that smoke plume of high concentration looks like. And the benefit of adding CMAC is you do get that knowledge of atmospheric physics and chemistry and fire emissions. Um, so we believe that the, given that result, the, the fusion of observations with the corrected ZMAP model provided the best estimates. So we use that to estimate air quality across the fire period, which is um, what this animation is showing. And our findings were that it had a clear impact on air quality. So the PM 2.5 concentrations were greater than 190 micrograms per meter cubed. And something we wanted to call out for the health impacts is EPA identifies 24 hour concentrations greater than 150.5 is very unhealthy. So at this level, it's where you see adverse health outcomes in both sensitive groups and in the general population. And based on our estimates, um, when we combined it with census tract population data, we're estimating over the entire fire period, about 60,000 individuals were exposed to air pollutions greater than this level. So we're likely seeing health impacts. And then on one day alone, so October 13th was how the highest concentrations, 57 and individuals were also exposed to those unhealthy levels. So we can really see using this method, we get a good idea of the population impact of the um, wildfires. 
And this is just a summary of the results. So again, the CAMP really does improve the accuracy of the model and satellite outputs. Temporary station data improves the accuracy of the PM2.5 estimates. All of the BMA methods perform better than the standalone model or satellite drive products. Um, BME cricketing on observation produces the more accurate estimates at monitoring station locations, but when you fuse it with the CMAC model, once corrected, it's the best overall estimate, especially in smoke impacted station scarce regions. So once you're further from monitoring stations, and it also gives you that nice refinement in the smoke plume shape. And finally, the fires did have a clear impact on the air quality, reaching PM2.5 levels that were dangerous to human health. Great. Thank you, Stephanie. I'll just say a couple of words and then we'll wrap up and take questions. Um, but generally, we've seen two um, applications here of BME data diffusion, and I want to bring it back to the general ideas. Uh, first is that from these applications, our data sets would be available for others to use. Just uh, contact us and ask for them, including for health impact assessment work and for epidemiology. So we're looking for people who might be interested in using our global ozone maps in particular to do epidemiology and uh, especially out of uh, the United States and Europe, for example. Um, so thinking about um, the rest of the world. Um, you, with these methods, we found that fusing data from multiple sources usually forms, performs better than single data sets. And that's one of the advantages here and why we think that there's a wide range of uses. uses. Uh, the BME data fusion methods are pretty flexible and adaptable to a wide range of applications and different input data. Um, so we'll conclude here, but we wanted to thank NASA HACAS for the opportunity to speak today and for the funding that supported this work. Um, also, um, this work's been supported by a NIOSH training grant. We thank people that were involved in TOR and the modeling groups um, that uh, helped us with the ozone uh, uh, study. Our ozone mapping study was also part of, um, um, it was uh, part of the core funding we received from NASA HACAS, but we uh, also did that work as part of the, what's called the Indicators Tiger, Tiger Team, which was led by Susan Annenberg. And our work on California wildfires was part of that Tiger Team, and we thank the people that were involved with that. So we'll conclude there, and we'll be happy to take some questions. So thanks for uh, listening to us.